everyone, this is People in Power, and I'm Sama El Shahat. On today's program, the killing season. They are murderers. They are responsible for the death of a lot of children and mothers in this country. Malaria is a global problem. As many as half the world's population are at risk of catching the mosquito-borne disease. It infects more than 500 million people a year and kills more than 1 million. Yet it's long been known that malaria can be prevented with bed nets steeped in insecticide or treated with drugs known as ACTs, which interrupt the life cycle of the mosquito-borne parasite. So why then, despite all the apparent efforts of governments, NGOs and public health experts to distribute nets and drugs, are so many people still dying? That's a question of a special relevance to many Ugandans. Their country has one of the highest malaria mortality rates in the world, with around 120,000 people being killed every year, almost all of them needlessly. Filmmaker Mark Honigsbaum went to Uganda looking for answers and uncovered a troubling story of corruption and neglect that may even undermine Africa's and the world's best defense against the disease. For 20 years, the Kitgum region of northern Uganda was at the mercy of the Lord's Resistance Army, a rebel group infamous for rape, murder, and the abduction of child soldiers. Driven from their homes, refugees sought sanctuary in temporary camps, sparking a humanitarian crisis. Today, the rebels are gone, but as life returns to normal, a new war has begun. The enemy this time, malaria. I've seen about one kid a week die since I've been here. Again, this is um, high season, malaria season, um, rainy season. Right after it rains, after the incubation period, seven to 14 days, the hospital's full of kids with malaria. In theory, malaria is easily treated with drugs known as ACTs. But ACTs are valuable, and in Uganda, as in other parts of Africa, there is a growing black market trade in the medications. Left unchecked, that trade threatens our best and currently last defense against the disease. There is a racket. They are responsible for the death of a lot of children and mothers in this country. These are the invisible victims of malaria. Every day, the disease kills 340 people in Uganda, the majority of them women and children under five. That's nearly 120,000 deaths a year from a disease that is entirely preventable. Malaria is transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito. Hatching in stagnant water, the mosquito spreads its poison at night when it emerges to take a blood meal. With each bite, the mosquito injects hundreds of tiny parasites into the bloodstream of its victims. The symptoms are unforgettable. The parasites devour the red blood cells, sparking fevers, chills, and agonizing headaches. In the worst cases, malaria can also result in anemia, coma, and death. In theory, all it takes to prevent mosquitoes transmitting the disease are bed nets treated with insecticides. And all it takes to interrupt the life cycle of the malaria parasite is a course of treatment with these pills. The pills contain a miraculous compound known as artemisinin, derived from a plant cultivated in China. If administered correctly, Artemisinin is a complete cure for the disease. These drugs are more rapidly effective than any other anti-malarial drug, which means you get better more quickly. And they're very, very reliable, and they're very well tolerated. In fact, they're remarkable. In countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Zambia, ACTs donated by Western donors are now leading to dramatic falls in the incidence of malaria. But Uganda has not been so fortunate. Here, ACTs donated by Western taxpayers are still not reaching people in need. In theory, ACTs are supposed to be available free of charge at government hospitals and clinics. But Uganda's health system is in disarray. Worse, officials are now rumored to be selling the drugs on the black market, inflating the cost 
and leading to unlicensed prescribing. As a result, many people are being given the wrong treatments. In the Kitgum region, the makeshift graves scattered throughout the village are a chilling reminder of what happens when children fail to get the correct medication. When Joyce Adong's son, Innocent, fell ill, her first impulse was to seek help from a local pharmacist. He guessed the boy had malaria, but as Joyce only had 500 Ugandan shillings, about 20 cents, she could not afford an ACT. Instead, the pharmacist prescribed an old line malaria drug. Within minutes of taking the pills, she says Innocent vomited, and instead of getting better, his fever got worse. Malaria is a potentially preventable and treatable disease, so it seems quite ridiculous that all these sick kids are populating the hospital. These kids here are just not getting the medications at the correct dosage or the correct amount at the right time. The shortage of ACTs is being felt throughout the country. In Namakora, near the border with Sudan, the health center there is now completely out of Kwartum, an ACT purchased by the government. These are the only drugs that we still have uh, at the quantities left in this tour. Uh, we don't have quite them completely. Uh, what we are using is now uh, Fansida. Fansida, also known as Oradar, is an old line medication that is now useless against many strains of the parasite. The storeroom is empty, despite the fact that Matthew places an order in advance every quarter. The government coartum is supposed to come every four weeks but there hasn't been a delivery for two months. Currently, <clears throat> I, have, I was told there's already some drugs which they, they brought in, in the medical store. So uh, because of transport uh, problem, I think it has delayed. This has been a common problem. Usually, drugs delay there. It is only out of frustration that we are moving down. If delivered promptly, and in the correct dosage, ACTs save lives. But all too often, the medications don't reach women and children in time. According to Dr. Lawrence Ojum, the results can be heartbreaking. He's still stiff, you see, you can see, he's stiff. So this child we need to, right now again, put on more, more treatment. Uh, this child can recover, but uh, my concern is the child could end up with some residual of brain damage. Kitcom General should be the first port of call for emergency cases, as treatment there is free. But because the drug supplies are erratic, many patients prefer to go to St. Joseph's, the local Catholic missionary hospital. Overall, we have now 633 patients, but 439 are children. Look at the magnitude. And these children are mainly malaria, 80% actually a case of malaria. Last night, actually, we had the three children referred. Uh, one died because of real anemia. The second one came actually with convulsions from, I would say, a distance of about 25 kilometers away. That one also came. We started treatment, but could not really catch up. And the other one had the pneumonia with malaria, also died. This is what happened last night, and this is a common trend. Many of the casualties are buried in the grounds of the hospital. Often the difference between life and death is as simple as providing good quality care at the local level. Unfortunately, many drug shops don't have the facilities to carry out proper diagnostic tests. Worse, even when patients are prescribed the correct drugs, many fail to complete the treatment. We're all familiar with these issues when the doctor tells you to, you know, take 10 days of penicillin and you take it for a day and you feel better and then you forget. And this is a, a common thing in developed countries too. Um, but with something like malaria, it's even more important that you take the full course. If you don't, you're having a, a suboptimal level of the drug in your system and you might start creating resistant organisms. And that's, that's the biggest fear is that these artemisinin and artemether derived combinations, if they're misused and the resistance develops, it's a big problem. Not just for Uganda, 
for the whole world. This is Pai Lin in Western Cambodia. It was here that in the 1960s, resistance first emerged to chloroquine, then the standard treatment for malaria. Within a few years, migrant workers had spread resistance to other parts of Asia. In the 1980s, the same thing happened with Bansadar. Then, in the late 1990s, resistance spread to Africa, prompting the World Health Organization to call for governments to switch to ACT. Now, scientists fear history could be repeating itself. It usually takes just 48 hours for artemisinin to clear the bloodstream of parasites. But some Cambodian patients now require higher doses and are taking almost twice as long to recover. If artemisinin follows the same pattern as chloroquine and fanzadar, then within 30 years that resistance could spread worldwide. Professor Nick White first read about artemisinin in the 1980s. He's now a leading campaigner for ACTs. If artemisinin resistance spreads to Africa, then we will have a replay of what happened with chloroquine resistance. Rising mortality and morbidity, more children dying, more sick children, more anemic children, more children who can't go to school, more low birth weight babies. It's a it will be a humanitarian disaster, and it's avoidable. The causes of resistance are complex, but one of the drivers is the black market trade in malaria drugs. In July, a court in Kampala sentenced Annalisa Mondon and her widowed aunt, Elizabeth Nugarano, to five years each in prison. Their crime? Setting up a bogus company called Value Added Health and embezzling $16,000 in grants meant for HIV and malaria. The prosecutions are part of a much wider probe into the theft of money from the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, dating back to 2005. A very good evening and welcome to this edition of the 933 KFM Hot Set, Charles Mongo Shampaki. The scandal is a major talking point. Charles Magani, a Ugandan journalist who's been following the story for his radio show, says the authorities need to be tougher. It's beyond description that someone can act with such a level of impunity. And they were sentenced for only five years, uh, which is a bit of a disappointment. They should have served longer. In all, investigators suspect 38 officials of siphoning off around $1.5 million in global fund money. But to date, just six people have been prosecuted, and only a fraction of the money has been returned. If the Uganda government cared that much, they would send people to jail. If you've been caught with your hand in the till, you pay for it, and pay for it heavy. However, the government sees things differently. The Minister of Health assured us that the government was addressing corruption at the national level, and that the shortages were not his fault. Instead, he pointed the finger at corrupt officials in the districts. Stockouts, we are beginning to realize, are not genuine stockouts. The medicines we have in the country should be enough. What's actually, are you saying that people are stealing these drugs from the hospitals, from the warehouses? Yes. The drugs are transported from what we call the national medical stores in lorries to districts and regional referral hospitals. We discovered that in some cases, these drugs were not delivered. They are selling those drugs to the South Strand. The National Medical Store delivered drugs to districts every month, but they are stolen. Dr. Malinga has now set up a dedicated hotline in the hope of encouraging Ugandans to report the thefts. I will tell them this, look, the, your government is buying enough drugs for you. Your children, your wives, and the men have enough drugs in the country to cover all your illness, especially malaria. They are your drugs, you should be getting them free, but there are thieves who are taking them away from you. Either they are selling them in neighboring countries, or they are selling them back to you. He also had stern words for the thieves. They are killers. They are murderers. 
they are responsible for the death of a lot of children and mothers in this country. Killing somebody is uh, a terrible crime. This is William Street in downtown Kampala, an area known as Pharmacy Village. At first glance, it looks like any other busy pharmacy district, but it's also home to a thriving black market. David Nahamia, a senior inspector with Uganda's National Drug Authority, is an expert on the gangs behind the illicit trade. They are very well organized. They don't steal over the counter. And they will not sell anybody to anybody. They will first, if they suspect, they will not sell to you. And, but if they are comfortable with you, they will say, give me the money. Give me the money, you go somewhere, get the drug. It's an organized crime. Last year, in a joint operation with Interpol, Ugandan police infiltrated the gangs by posing as undercover buyers and seized several packs of duo Cotexin an ACT that had been donated to Tanzania. The drugs had been sitting in the warehouse for too long and were past their expiry date, so someone had simply removed the date from the foil strip. Inspector Nahamia also arrested two men for selling coartum stolen from the public sector. We knew it because that specific pack is specifically procured by government through the national medical stores. They're not supposed to be in the private sector. The public, private sector has a different pack. And um, when we trace it backward, of course, we found that maybe it was good from some health centers, although the culprits were not able to reveal where they got it from. They decided would, to decide that they would rather get conviction. You see, they are, uh, are diehards. They don't want to reveal where they got it from because they know, of course, our penalties are not very harsh. You will just be scot-free. Problem is that on the open market, a pack of publicly donated coartum can fetch up to 20,000 Ugandan shillings, about nine US dollars. To make it harder to sell coartum meant for the public sector, the pills are now being stamped property of the government of Uganda. But Inspector Nahamia says the ultimate responsibility must lie with the consumer. We also want the users, the public, to watch out. To watch out. They shouldn't buy that drug which is for the government. That's free, that's for them, free of charge. Uganda is not the only country with a problem. These ACTs were purchased by Kenya using donor money from the Global Fund. The pills were stamped government of Kenya not for sale. But earlier this year, they were found at a drug shop in eastern Uganda. Africa also has a growing problem with counterfeit medications. In July, this packet of fake coartum was found on sale at several pharmacies in Ghana. The packaging is nearly identical. The giveaway is that the real product comes in strips of six, not eight. Similar counterfeits have also been found in Cameroon. When the pills were analyzed, chemists were shocked to discover that they contain no active ingredients whatsoever. I think producing counterfeit anti-malarials is premeditated murder. This is a disease that uh, kills, and you are fooling poor, often uneducated, vulnerable people. Uh, you're, it's often the children who die. And to make uh, a, a medicine or a non-medicine and fool these people who think they're going to save the life of their, their child or their husband or wife with the tablets that they, they're buying, and to fool them in that, in that respect, I think is premeditated murder. But what if there was a simple solution to the drug supply problem? What if Africans were able to manufacture their own ACTs? That's the thinking behind Quality Chemicals, a subsidiary of the Indian pharmaceutical company Sipla. This is the first of its kind on the African continent. 80% of uh, malaria cases are found in Africa, but Africa uh, manufactures 
only 1% of the drugs, we had to respond uh, to, to this inequality. These are mobile storage racks. When Atmithia comes in, uh, it's, it's sampled and cleared. Uh, this is where it is stored. We've got to make sure there is no chance at all of any cross-contamination whatsoever. And uh, the, the, this, is why it's, this is quite a very expensive way of, of storage, but the, these are the standards and we cannot compromise on that. So far, CIPLA and the Ugandan government, which has a 50% stake in the plant, have invested $30 million in the factory. The equipment is state-of-the-art. That's what is called the bed processor, and that's when all the raw materials are got and mixed together. From here, uh, raw materials are ready to be compressed. Uh, this is a very, very modern compression machine, and this can do up to three drugs mixed into one can be compressed into this. Yeah. We've got four of them, and in between per, per session, uh, per, per shift of eight hours, we can do up to two million tablets. That's up to six million ACTs a day. In theory, enough to supply not only Uganda, but all her neighbors too. We can supply to the entire continent. Although our focus right now is to fulfill the requirements for Uganda, and then we go to the neighboring countries within the East African community, the Great Lakes region, and then we can look at Africa. He also says the quality chemical ACTs would be easier to distribute. The drugs will get to be more quicker uh, because we shall get the raw materials on time. We shall plan our production processes on time. We shall get the products into the distribution channel, the public distribution channel on time. And then the drugs will reach the final consumer on time. However, despite the urgent need for alternative sources of ACTs in East Africa, Quality Chemicals has not been able to bid for donor funds to supply malaria drugs for want of the correct paperwork. Indeed, it was only in March that the World Health Organization finally granted Quality Chemicals its international seal of approval. Is that frustrating? It is indeed frustrating. It is indeed frustrating. This is an investment of over $30 million. You want it to be used to 100% capacity. What we are trying to work towards is to see if we can sustain the anti-malarial campaign on our own in the country. Once the factor is approved by the World Health Organization, we shall be accessing these drugs much cheaper than importing them from outside. Even the government's critics say it's a gamble worth taking. It's a beautiful idea. That factory needs to get running. He needs to produce the drugs. Personally, I don't care how much money is sunk in at the beginning, provided at the end of the day it's able to produce the drugs that Ugandans need to be able to live an extra day. That's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on this report or any other matter, we'd love to hear from you on the usual address, aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time, bye-bye.